Welcome to World War II Indiana Landmarks, Episode 22, The Navy Ammunition Depot, Crane. I'm your host, Ron May, author of the book, World War II Indiana Landmarks. For this episode, we travel southwest down Interstate 69 into Martin County, home to the former Navy Ammunition Depot and today's Naval Support Activities Naval Surface Warfare Center. This rural area is home to the third largest U.S. Navy installation in the world, and yet it isn't anywhere near an ocean. This largely unknown and well-kept secret base is in the remote, largely unpopulated, and rural stretches of Martin County in southern Indiana. Nothing about the land or the topography looks like the right place for building a Navy base. Nevertheless, in December 1940, local newspapers reported that the Navy Department had purchased state-owned land for the construction of a large depot to store ammunition for their Atlantic fleet of ships. The northern part of Martin County, Indiana, proved to be the ideal spot for this base. Its inland location, far from the east coast, protected it from the threat of enemy submarine or airborne bombardment. The land was far from cities and population centers, but it still had decent road and railway access for shipping, as well as a water supply and power. And its hilly, forested terrain allowed for excellent concealment of the ammunition storage magazines. Construction of the new depot began in January 1941 and progressed quickly. Barely 12 months later, the new ammunition depot was commissioned on December 1st, 1941, six days before the Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor. The depot was officially named the Naval Ammunition Depot Burn City for its location close to the small town of Burn City. But the name of the base was later changed to the Navy Ammunition Depot Crane, named after a former Navy hero. First building to be erected on the base was the administration building. It still stands today. In 1943, the depot was renamed the U.S. Naval Ammunition Depot Crane, Indiana, to honor Commodore William Montgomery Crane of New Jersey. He was the first chief of the Bureau of Ordnance and Hydro Hydrography for the Navy in 1842. A limestone bust of the Commodore was placed across the street from the administration building. It still stands today. The primary mission of the new depot was to store, prepare, and issue all types of ammunition and maintain and operate various types of ammunition loading and processing plants. Storing so much ammunition was accomplished by erecting over a hundred smokeless powder magazines, as well as storage warehouses, shop buildings, barracks, homes for the Navy officers, administrative buildings, and many other buildings. One of the most important and costly buildings on the depot was the pyrotechnic or star shell plant, which had the appearance of a giant Noah's Ark. Parachutes were inserted into the bottom of the shells. After being fired high into the sky and behind the enemy lines, they descended slowly and illuminated enemy targets. Their great worth was affirmed in a telegram to the Naval Ammunition Depot crane from Rear Admiral W.H.P. Blandy, the U.S. Navy Chief of the Bureau Ordnance at the time. He wrote, quote, Parachute flares such as you manufacture for the Navy have proven to be an important factor in the success of night bombing missions. The commanding officer of a patrol squadron who took part in the first air raid on Munda reported, On night attacks, we always pull flares as we finish our bombing run. We think these flares are wonderful things to help in the getaway. They are so bright and blinding that any anti-aircraft fire is usually thrown off completely by them. You are to be congratulated on producing equipment of such value to our gallant naval aviators." End of quote. 
Some of the other significant structures built on the depot included over a thousand arch-type magazines, just over 500 inflammable material magazines, 167 inert storehouses, and five torpedo storehouses. All of these were spread throughout the massive grounds and easily accessed by rail lines. When the depot was completed, it consisted of 138 miles of railroad, 226 miles of roads, 65 miles of water lines, and production facilities for small projectile and flare loading, mine and bomb filling, case preparation, rocket motor assembly, as well as the manufacturing of 20 and 40 millimeter ammunition. Navy leaders initially projected that they would need 500 to 750 civilians to work at the ammunition, ammunition depot crane. Once the U.S. entered the war, however, that number increased dramatically. The depot quickly faced significant labor shortages with young men getting drafted or enlisting for military service. The diminished labor pool was augmented by employing teen boys referred to as BOWs, boy ordnance workers, and young women, known as WOWs, women ordnance workers, many of them under the age of 18. Even with these efforts, there were still labor shortages. In 1944, the Navy employed 200 Indiana University students to work at the depot on weekends. And in March of that same year, a detachment of WAVES, women accepted for volunteer emergency service, arrived at Crane, and later that same year in August, the Navy established and sent an Ordnance Battalion, consisting of 1,200 Navy Seabees. The number of civilian employees at the Navy Ammunition Depot Crane climbed to 9,500 by the summer of 1945. The flow of workers came from a hundred different towns and villages, and some of them traveled distances of 140 miles round trip. More than a third of the close to 10,000 workers were women. Lucille Arvin of Martin County was one of the first women employed at the base. In July 1942, she began working in the production ammunition loading plant. She was taught how to safely load explosives, as well as press, fuse, paint, mark, inspect, and pack them for shipment to the fleet. By October 1944, women were doing even more of the work once done by the men. By then, men were very scarce, recalled Lucille Arvin in an interview. She continued, women had to do all the operations, loading and unloading boxcars and some trucks. Some truck drivers were women opening boxes of component parts, palletizing loaded, loaded rockets, and assisting with testing on the rocket range. All of the workers, both men and women, proved effective in their output. During the months of August to October 1944, the monthly production average was 50,000 tons of shells, flares, and other munitions sent to Navy ships of the Atlantic Fleet for the war effort. Added to this impressive number of munitions were some of the first rockets used in the war. They were transported to Indianapolis in armed trucks and then flown to both coasts for aerial transportation to the fighting fronts. Records show that in some instances they were fired at the enemy within four days after leaving the depot. The shells produced and stored at the Navy Ammunition Depot Crane contributed to the victory of the Allies in both the European and the Pacific theaters. The ammunition worked well enough not only to help win the war, but also to ensure the Navy's presence in rural southern Indiana for generations to come. By January 1945, the Navy Department decided to expand the operations at the Navy Ammunition Depot Crane at a cost of $10 million. Today, the depot is called the Naval Surface Warfare Center Crane Division, 
It is the principal tenant command located at Naval Support Activity Crane and employs over 3,800 people. Its mission is to provide acquisition engineering, in-service engineering, and technical support for sensors, electronics, electronic warfare, and special warfare weapons. It is the only NAVC Warfare Center located in the Midwest, and it remains the third largest Navy installation in the world and a major employer in rural Martin and surrounding counties. Learn more about the history of the Navy Ammunition Depot Crane and those who worked there in my new book, World War II Indiana Landmarks, available for purchase on my website or wherever books are sold. And while on my website, check out my trilogy of Indiana World War II service stories. Thanks for tuning in to this episode.